Um, our next speaker is uh, Nelson Matthew Scalbania. And uh, his business career is so astonishing that I had to kind of bring his CV out. Uh, it's pretty obvious that there is not a business that Nelson Scalbadia has not owned, made, and lost a lot of money in. <laughs> <laughs> um, just let me give you a taste of this. Um, sawmills, breweries, art galleries, theme parks, motorcycles, a mineral company, a renewal energy and water research and development company, a plastics company. In the service industry, he's owned seven different restaurants, nine different hotels, a long distance telephone marketing company. He's even made a full length feature film. I bet you lost a buck or two on that, Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nelson Scalvania, what an energy. Uh, life is what happens when you're too busy making other plans. Good evening. If there was a unique feature of, of my career, it's, I didn't have one. I had several. Why I do so many businesses, I guess I like the excitement, the variety, the education. And they're all supposedly profit-motivated. Otherwise, you're, doing, you're, not, you're not right. Uh, but let's, let's kind of get on to a few of the things that I've done. Now, kind of bear with me here. I, I'm going to have a, it's, I think, I, as an engineer, all people's lives can be put in graph form. That's the graph of my life. <laughs> now, the, this positive and negative, you barely see the negative. Negative is easy to say. Negative is you're either dead or wished you were. <laughs> the positive is kind of the accumulation of everything. You know, it's your health, your family's health, your friend's health, both mental and physical. You have a bunch of material assets, a lot of toys. Now, right at the very peak, you kind of see a, where I, I'm about 38, 39 years old. But I kind of accumulated a bunch of toys. And I probably wanted all these things because I wanted them when I was young, so when I wasn't bald and didn't have prostate cancer, I guess. So I, I, you know, at my peak, I had six homes in various parts of the world, six cars, of which four were Roses and three were convertibles, long-range jet, 180-foot uh, yacht in the better train with a full-time crew of 13, a lot of art, t 10 different sports teams, part or all of them. And how did I pay for these things? I kind of bought things and sold them, because all those things you can't get a bank loan on. So you had to make money somehow. So I, they tell me I created that word flip. Well, I bought buildings and resold them for more so I could buy things that banks wouldn't give you any money on. Now, I don't know why flip became such a derogatory term. The guy speaking after me, Von Medell, makes wine for a dollar and he flips it for two dollars. Now, that's not bad because he makes wine himself, but it was always bad in, in, my, in my situation. Now, just a couple of the bad things. Start of the bad thing, get over them. In 1982 or so, bank prime was 24%, believe it or not. I, had, I just got divorced. Uh, I, had the, I had the jet, the boats, the land, uh, six teams, five of which were losing money. So try to service that with no buyers. And that, what, was, what was even worse, there are no buyers in the world. They disappeared. So when I had my first check bounce at 43, that was, ugh, that was awful. After the next 50 bounce, I got kind of used to it. <laughs> anyway, I didn't declare bankruptcy, but I restructured. Restructured means chapter, chapter 11, you kind of pay down the road kind of thing. So that was a bad time for me. Uh, then I was getting engaged. I, I remarried, and I married a, a Greek gal. And I was taken off from Vancouver, and I picked up the newspaper, and, and I saw the uh, Atlanta Flames were in some trouble and for sale. So when I landed in Athens, I called my young daughter and I said, I, I knew one thing about the sports business. The best way to make money in the sports business is move a franchise to a pregnant city, a city that hasn't got that team. So I had my young daughter, Rosanda, take a check for a million dollars, uncertified, and she flew down to Atlanta and, and I said, try and buy it for 16 million. 
he calls me back in, in, uh, uh, in Athens and says, Dad, he accepted. Oh, Jesus. Now I've got to run home, cover the check, first of all, and then add 30 days to pay the balance of the dollars. The end result of that was I ended up owning 51% of the team for a total investment of minus $1 million. So that was kind of one of my, one of my fun deals. But you know, in the, in the audience, when you start talking, I just kind of a bunch of deals remembered. Phil Nugent was here. I, did a, I had a submarine company. I was building a submarine for the Russians way back. Phil was my first consultant. And then the CIA showed up one day and said, you shouldn't be doing that, so we had a fold. <laughs> Then, then, then the next speaker was a guy, was an astronaut. After the Challenger went down, some NASA guys came to me, engineers came to me and said, look, we gotta start building rockets because nobody's sending these commercial satellites up. So I go down to Titusville, which is just out of Fort Lauderdale or out of um, Cape Canaveral, and we start designing to build rockets. And all of a sudden we needed a lot of intellectual property rights from NASA, at which time the CIA, CIA showed up again. And they said, you're a Canadian. No foreigners are allowed to be part of a company that's having this stuff. So I started a company called E Prime Aerospace, but then went on my way. But <laughs> let, me, let me just finish with a couple of, let me finish with a couple of kind of, I call them exotic deals. In mid-73, I had done a, an engineering job with a fellow in Santiago, Chile, who calls me up in the middle of the summer and says, God, come down with some U.S. dollars in your shoes, because at that time Allende was the, Allende was the uh, uh, dictator, and there was total chaos in the country. There was a curfew. The military was just rampant, stealing whatever they could steal. It was a terrible time. So he said, come down, you can buy things. So I made three trips. I made three trips in the summer of 73, and I, he took me around to bank managers' homes, and we bought, I bought paintings. I took them off the walls and gave them some dollars. And many of the paintings had on the back of the wall, the back of the painting, national treasure, cannot leave country. There were Monet's, Picasso's, Von Roosdales, that kind of stuff. I got 25 of them. And the <laughs> earthquake happened, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, on September 10th, I don't know what, I, I go down to the customs and I have to do what's necessary to the customs guy to get them on the plane. So I put half on Braniff, half on Canadian Pacific and left the 10th of September, 73. You know, the date's well known to me because on September the 11th, Allende was assassinated. Anyway, all the paintings showed up. So I somehow thought, like, these paintings are here. Now, he was just assassinated, and I left the country the day before. Maybe there's a connection there. I don't know. Anyway, after four, <laughs> month, after four months with the paintings, I went to Christie's, Sotheby's, and all those places. 20, 23 of the 25 paintings were fake. I sold one to cover up all of my good one to cover all my costs, and I have the rest to this day. But now, where some of the lessons learned? Some of the lessons learned. Uh, I'll mention only three. Uh, the first one, I guess, <laughs> first one. There's too many now. I try to pick out which three. <laughs> you know, when you go into a project, putting up half the money is worse than putting up no money. You aggravate a lot less people. It'll, it'll take a while to, for that to sink in, and probably the parallel to that is uh, do a lot more quality deals than quantity deals. Uh, another one is stash something away that people can't touch. So, you, so for an emergency, <coughs> the emergencies are divorce, blackmail, <laughs> uh, stupid mistakes, downturn in economy and health hiccups. All of those happened to me. But I wasn't too smart enough to stash anything away. <laughs> Don't sell good things to pay for bad things. Everything should sink and swim on its own. Just two quick examples. I had the flames, and I sold the flames for eight, made maybe $8 million to pay off the Boomers, which is a North American Soccer League team I had in Calgary. Now, I should let the Boomers go and kept this asset because it's now worth 200 million. Instead, I sold the flames. That wasn't so smart. I used to own the down, uh, with my wife, we owned the Georgia Hotel in downtown Vancouver. <coughs> paid 13 million for it, sold it for 32 million. Why? Because I had to. I took my half and paid off the Montreal Alouettes. That was very smart. I should have let them go. Uh, and even then, that wasn't enough. Uh, my wife took her half 
and owns to this day a lovely hotel in Vancouver called the Wedgwood Hotel. So if you go to Vancouver, go and see the Wedgwood Hotel. Uh, probably in finishing, I should finish the way I started. Life is what happens when you're too busy making other plans and old age comes at a bad time. <laughs>